But thank you so much for coming to the last session of the day. We're really excited to have you here and really excited for our panel. Um, we're going to be talking about innovations in employment for adults with autism and developmental disabilities. Um, our first speaker is Steve Kaisman. Steve is a transition and neurodiversity employment specialist and the vice president of education at Identifor, the world's first game-based career assessment tool. With two masters in education, one from NYU in SPED and another in education administration with a concentration in law, and with over three decades of experience in the New York City Department of Education and work in disruptive technology, Steve focuses on supporting families, communities, and employers in using Identifor to learn about and leveraging skills, abilities, and interests to plan a more meaningful life. Steve? Thank you. Um, if you've seen me in the last session, I thank you for coming again, but you're probably going to be very disappointed because it's going to be a shortened version of what I did in the last session. And to tell you the truth, I've never done, I've never done this in 15 minutes, which is the allotted time that I have. So if I go fast, you'll understand that it's um, to try to get through as much as possible, but I will be staying by to answer questions that people may have um, before I leave. So as I, um, as I was introduced, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about something that's pretty cool, at least the feedback that I've gotten today and in other places that I've been in. And one of the things that I want to talk about is something that I bring up all the time. How do we decide what are we even trying, what's the end point of where we're trying to get our young people to? What are we even trying to do? So when I crisscross the country, I often start, when I have more time, I often start the discussion with, what do you think makes a meaningful, what would make a meaningful life for your child? And I also ask that for people who have neurotypical children as well. And oftentimes when I ask that question, you're laughing, thank you, I worked hard on this slide, I'm glad that I got that reaction, thank you. I always get, almost always get these same answers again and again, and what's most interesting in almost every single presentation that I've ever done, the one that is always the most important one is a great job. So I wanted to just make that point because that's something that so many people are always asking about. But as I get myself in trouble many times, I say that the greatest weakness of IDEA is in transition. As long as there is no promise of meaningful work at, for every child with an IEP when they graduate from school, it means that there's never going to be teeth in that law. I see people shaking their heads, so you're getting what I'm saying. So really what we're doing is all we're really doing is we're prolonging the suffering for our children to graduate to the couch. And part of the problem is the discovery process. And what I mean by that is for people who are neurotypical, this is rather easy, but when it comes to the discovery process, of the approximate 34% of all people with autism who are nonverbal, and so many other people with autism who just aren't able to give us the information that we're looking for, we really can't make a true assessment of that person so that we can start the process of getting them that meaningful job and that meaningful life. I'm guilty myself with my two children with disabilities, with intellectual disabilities, in that, yep, I work very hard to make sure that they have a sheltered existence, and it's not something that, at the end of the day, is really to their benefit, but it's just something that I think a lot of parents, uh, folks who are shaking their heads, get. They also have very limited experiences. They're not very self-aware. And as I said before, so many of the folks that we deal with, with intellectual disabilities, especially autism, are nonverbal. But does that mean that they have no value in a job setting? I argue not. <clears throat> so we're not able to get the same kinds of information that we get, especially in a bias-free type of setting. And all too often, anybody here who has a young person with Autism works with a person with autism, knows that there really are huge, huge problems in almost 100% of the cases um, when it comes to scantrons, bubble sheets, and standardized tests in general. 
So the biggest problem is that career planning begins with assessment. But what happens if we're unable to really do a good assessment of our kids? How do we start that career planning? And in most cases, what we do, and anyone here who uh, you know is a job developer or works for an agency knows, we knock on doors and we beg people and we cohort, we we. Uh, try to um, uh, convince people to take this young person, hasn't had a meltdown in two weeks, great attendance, nice person, please, please. And it's very, very frustrating to do that over and over to try to figure out what somebody is good at and what they're not so good at. One of the things that really made a problem for us is also a good thing. So lots of employers now are looking for people with autism to join their workforce. The problem is that with DSM-5, we got rid of the term Asperger. But unfortunately, the second rule is that employers want highest functioning workers. And rule number three is C number two. So when you hear about lots of companies that are looking for an autism at work program, they're definitely interested if you send them somebody who is on the highest function area. So I think it's great that, um, you know, lots of TV shows, medias, and things like that have really increased autism awareness. It's really put us on the map. It's really gotten us a lot of work opportunities and a lot of awareness that we never had before. And it's even starting to get quite a bit of acceptance for our kids. But I argue all too often if they're Sheldon Cooper and if they're the good doctor, they're the ones that are really sought after most by people who are looking to employ uh, autistic workers. So is it helping or is it hurting? I argue both, but it's certainly a big heavy lift to make sure that we don't overlook people who are on the spectrum that are not savants. Before I show you this slide, it's really important for me to make it clear so I'm not misquoted later on, which happened to me once and I'm very sensitive about this, is there's honor in all work. Let me say that again. Every job can be a good job for somebody if they're treated with respect, if they're compensated properly, if the person is happy, if the person has a really nice environment that they feel welcome and more than just a pair of hands. However, all too often our kids are put into or not just kids, but our young adults are put into one of the five Fs. Filing, folding, food, flowers, and filth. So no matter what the skills and abilities that a person has all too often, whether it's because these are funded jobs or whatever the reason might be, it's easier to put somebody in here. Our children are put into these types of jobs even if they have other skills and abilities. And that's why we put together Identifor. And I know I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to go through this really quickly, but I'll be spending lots of time after my presentation to answer any questions that you may have outside here, um, outside of this room. So Identifor has three dimensions to it. It's career direction, meaningful employment, and 24-7 support. And I would just want to go over each one real quickly. So what we did is we developed, as um, in my introduction, you heard what Catherine said, is that we developed the world's first game-based career assessment tool specifically designed for people with autism. So people with autism or anybody can play our games, and instead of banning kids from playing games, we said we're not going to stop them anyhow. Let's leverage their game-playing interest. And by them playing dozens and dozens of games, we're able to find out different things about them. So we're able to look at three dimensions behind uh, the game playing. One is executive functions. The other is when measuring their multiple intelligences. And the third is the John Holland or Reasec code. And we use that because it's been used for the last 85 years by the Department of Labor. And until today, it's the only career assessment tool that they feel is valid and reliable to be used. We gamify that, and that's part of Identifor as well. So by playing all of these different games, we have these very sophisticated dashboards. You always hear people talk about person-centered planning. You always hear about people saying that they're strength-based. We're able here to look at 
what are the strengths that this particular person has and in what area do they have those strengths so that we can leverage those strengths rather than trying to just fix the areas that, they are, um, that may be weaker or more challenging. And then from there, we're able to make specific career predictions. We make specific career suggestions for a person, and each one of those suggestions are hyperlinked, as you can see here, taking that person to the ONET online website. And if you don't know about the online, uh, um, if you don't know about the ONET online website, then consider yourself lucky for coming to this talk today because it's an invaluable free service that's put together by the Department of Labor that I recommend everybody interested in employment at least take a look at. Because what they do is they take well over a thousand job titles and they break them down to, into the most granular possible way so that we could really look at true goals and objectives. We could look at real ways of getting a person into one of these fields if after looking at this, it looks like it may be a good job match for that person as well. So now what we have is an enhanced portfolio for that person. And instead of knocking on a door and begging a person saying, please take this child and help them, we're now able to say, this person can provide value to your company in these specific areas. How can you make use of this person's skills and abilities? That's a very different conversation. You're shaking your head, you know what I mean? Rather than saying, please take this child, do us charity, now you're saying, how can they help your bottom line? And that's a huge paradigm shift. So instead of the five Fs, some of the areas that people with autism do very well in, again, each person is different. As my friend Stephen Shore always says, if you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism. But these are some of the 21st century jobs that people with autism often fit well in, depending on the support and other things like that, of course. But one of the things that I want to mention is you really need to start thinking about jobs that are automation, robotic, and artificial intelligence proof. And what I mean by that, most companies that are hiring people on the spectrum are looking for increased productivity to do the exact same thing faster with less errors. How can our young people compete? This is when I was up at the Amazon uh, Picking Center in northern New Jersey. How can anybody compete with a Kiva robot? In, stack, in, in picking from shelves and bringing stuff in a productive way? It's impossible. So why are we putting our kids into that role or responsibility when, after all, these robots are going to do it better? I want to tell you real quickly about my daughter. Her name is Melanie. That's not her. That's not her. That's her. And the reason I tell you about Melanie, she's an interesting story. Melanie has microcephaly 20 years before it became the disability du jour. And microcephaly is very, very similar to autism in all it really means is smallness of the head. Depending on where the head size is different, that's the part of the brain that's going to be impacted. Melanie is quite, quite impacted with uh, microcephaly. Low IQ, speech problems, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't know what to do with her. Everyone says these are her pro she's the nicest kid in the world, but these are her problems, her problems, and problems. Is there anything that she could do that's good? Only problems? So I came home one day and I was able to um, uh, introduce Identifor when it was in its planning stage for Melanie to play. She sat down and was all eager and said, I hate the computer. I'm not going to play these games. I don't want to play this. I said, please, I have to play these games. We're really interested. Maybe daddy wants to work for the company. And she said, nah, I don't want to play. Then I came up with the two magic words. Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Melanie, if we get an unlocked dashboard from you playing these games, because Identifor takes a while for you to play these games, not a one-off, not a Ouija board, but you have to play for a while. And if you play these games, we get an unlocked dashboard. She said, I could have anything I want. You could even take home another piece of cheesecake when we get an unlocked dashboard. <laughs> And there was hope when it was none before because Melanie was working in a New Jersey hospital that was a very, very well-regarded 
um, vocational um, uh, exploration program. But unfortunately, Melanie went from one F to the next F. She wore either the net on her head in the kitchen or she wore these big gloves when she was swapping the floor out. And my wife and I were heartbroken saying, geez, we think or we hope or we want there to be maybe something more. And from playing the Identifor games, we were able to see that Melanie, believe it or not, and we thought it was crazy at first, had a dashboard that showed that the suggested careers were in computers, but in database management and other things like that. And we said, this is impossible. We convinced the hospital to allow her to work in the, uh, to go one day a week with a full-time aide in the hospital's uh, computer uh, education program that they had. And after just three weeks, Melanie was typing 43 words a minute without a single error. She was begging my wife to do her PowerPoints. My wife is a high school teacher. She was begging my wife to do her PowerPoints, and she was even doing her, her colleagues' um, uh, newsletters on uh, Publisher. Um, and Melanie just took off with this whole thing, and she started to work, and there's Melanie in the middle, I'm sorry, Melanie in the middle here. You could see everybody else in this brochure is doing one of the five Fs, and very coincidentally, or I should say counterintuitively, there's Melanie in the middle working in the neuroscience department at the hospital. And then we tried her and see if she could do it in another hospital. She did, and she received a full Microsoft Office Specialist certification and that allowed her to get a job where she works independently, not because she has a disability. Nobody knew she had a disability, but no, they were just unable with a 3.7% unemployment rate to find somebody who was able to do the kinds of things that Melanie did. And Melanie now works on, a, uh, on an as-needed basis for this company and has been offered quite a few other jobs since then. We had no hope, we had no idea, we had no understanding that she would be able to even do that. So when I go around and I explain to people about how great this is, and people think, you know, they start clapping, and I tell them it's for free, and they can't believe me when I tell them that, that everything we do at Identifor is free, I say to them, hold on. What happens if we get the absolute best job for a person, the supervisor says, come back in 20 minutes, and they return on Wednesday? How long do you think they're going to keep that job not very long, I could tell you that. In fact, that's the number one reason why people lose their jobs. So, so um, what we decided to do at Identifor is decided not to just look at data points, but we put together something that gives 24-7 support because autism is forever. And uh, we need more support when that school bus stops coming than less support. So we put together an artificial intelligence-based app called Abby that's able to do lots of different things, um, making sure a person knows how to spend their money, making sure that their uh, medication compliance is perfect, making sure they know what clothes to wear depending on the weather, virtual wallet, all different things like that, and answer lots of the different questions that a, a person might have during the day. And I just want to show you Abby really quickly. <clears throat> so, you see, so you have a better understanding of what Abby looks and sounds like. Um, this is Abby, and we could ask her different questions like, how do I introduce myself? It can be polite to shake someone's hand when you meet them for the first time. Do this while greeting them and saying your name. They should then tell you their name. And we could ask different kinds of questions about um, uh, on-the-job behavior, even some of the hidden curriculum, like what, do we, what is TGIF? TGIF means thank God it's Friday. It means that the person is glad that it's the weekend and they don't have to go to work anymore. So we could ask all different kinds of questions, either by texting it or by asking it to be able to get the kind of support that a person needs to keep their job, to live independently, and to do all of those kinds of things that in the past they might have had some kind of supervisor. We have a bunch of other games coming out, lots of other enhancements, including full Amazon Alexa and Google Home integration, 
um, uh, some of the stuff that you see up here as well, lots of other things that are coming. Once again, everything that we do is free. I'm outside a little bit later on. I'll be answering any questions that you may have. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, so next up, we have David Grady. David has his master's and is the regional manager for State Council on Developmental Disabilities for Central Coast. He created two supported employment programs early in his career. David's background in employment combined with his knowledge of person-centered thinking enables him to take on a unique perspective on vocations for people with disabilities and employment-first prin principles that can be in, uh, in implemented within the developmental service system. David? Good afternoon, moms and dads. I'm Grandpa. <laughs> I just am overwhelmed by the, the complexity of um, a day like today. I mean, you've all gone to seminars and conferences about housing, and now you're about employment. I think as parents, it just must be overwhelming. So today, I'd like to talk about navigating the service system, particularly navigating employment services. I just presume that when a family's faced with all the, um, the uh, the, the, what's required for a child with autism to find work and how to do it through complicated state service systems they they don't understand. So my goal is to help help you all understand how to navigate the service system. Always work with your service coordinator. That's 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 important. Um, but work as an equal to your service coordinator and work with the understanding that service coordinators have a broad understanding of developmental disability services, but they may not know the nuances that are associated with vocational development. So work as an equal, discuss with them the various aspects of job, of acquiring, of um, developing a career, and where you are entering that world of career development. When I started doing employment services for folks with developmental disability, it was kind of a prescribed course you were to take. You would start off with learning your pre-vocational skills, and then you were to get your vocational skills, and then you were to get a job in the community. This this one, two, three, four recipe to get a, to get to build a career. Um, over time, it's it's not the way to think about career development. And the the um, graphic I have here is a uh, outward spinning spiral because there's no one path for career development for people with individual and developmental for people with developmental disabilities um, and rather than kind of going well let's complete this program and move into the next program what I'd like to encourage parents to do is are those kitchen table talks you might have on a Saturday morning when you are when you are trying to figure out what's best for our son or daughter and rather than kind of do that prescription-based uh, set of service delivery. Um, ask important questions. And the first question I encourage you to ask is, what level of support will my son or daughter need? Rather than focus in on the disability, rather than focus in on what they can't do, a better way to approach the understanding of your child's needs is, how can they do it, and what level of support do they need? And support ranges from low, which is just intermittent support, maybe once or twice a day. Uh, the Identifor um, Abbey system is a is a um, type of support that would be on the, you know, not a lot of not a lot of direct support from a direct service provider. But other children require more extreme levels of support, maybe one to one, throughout the entire day. So that's a first decision to make. In our service system, the way to think about supports is by ratio. Um, in old systems, we had ratios of up to 1 to 20. Uh, more and more, we're seeing those ratios go down. Community services are sometimes 1 to 3, 1 to 4. And in some cases, there is a question today asked to a, an executive director, what about those needing 1 to 1 support? So when thinking about supports, think about the ratio of the person with the disability and the direct service provider who's going to offer that assistance. When thinking about vocational services, where are they going to get their, where are they going to receive those services? Is it going to be in a classroom or a community, uh, in a classroom setting, or is it going to be in the community? We want to encourage 
uh, community integration rather than community inundation. So focus in on how do we want that child to be in the community but without being uh, part of a larger group that draws a lot of attention. Other things that you need to ask yourself are um, how are they going to get there, the, the services, uh, the transportation services that are needed. Before or during this kitchen table talk and in understanding vocational development, the, one of the most important conversations to have is where your son or, is at, where your, where your son or daughter is at internally, their internal disposition and their internal characteristics. What level of motivation do they have for a job? How ready are they for a job? Um, one of the things that I focus in on, on uh, quite a bit is what are their values? What is the value of my son or daughter? And how can those values be, be under, how can those values be translated into a, um, how can those values be translated either into a job, a vocation, or how can that job translate those values into a hobby or interest or a passion or an avocation. The, the exploration of self is a very important process. It's something that all parents should consider, and it's done through the person-centered planning model. On the external side of things, finding a job requires this series of processes. First is that discovery phase. And again, Identifor has that, uh, that um, ability to go onto the dashboard and find out where the child's skills and interests are. But discovery can be done in a variety of ways, but it requires an exploration. Other important aspects is skill acquisition. And currently, there's a move to have our folks get training in a variety of settings. And so once you're moving in a direction toward a job, where are they going to acquire those skills? Then how are they going to find the job? What organization is going to offer it? And what is, this, what is the support or the job coaching that they're going to provide to get that person successful at the job? And if you see the arrows on this spiral, it doesn't go in a straight line. It goes kind of in that outward spiral. And it can go in any direction at any time. So think again of an outward spiral in developing jobs. How many have heard of Employment First? All right. Employment First is an important set of regulations in the state of California that encourages all people, regardless of their level of disability, to have a plan put together to have them work. So let me ask, do you believe your son or daughter will be able to work? All right. OK. Are, those who are, are there anyone here who's less confident about that? OK, so yeah, a couple of us feel that way. So I'm glad that we have a lot of yeses, and I understand that there's a few no's. I completely understand a few no's. And rather than it being a situation where your son or daughter has to step up, really because of employment first, the system has to adjust to allow those with, with, who may be less able to find work in a traditional way to come up with models that they can use in order for them to have a situation where money can exchange hands. Catherine, our moderator here, is in charge of a set of services at San Andreas Regional Center, which is to increase the opportunity for folks with developmental disability to have jobs. To, she ha she's running two programs that are promoting incentives for people to be, to, be, to be able to work. So when thinking about vocational development, um, there's a need for coordination. And that coordination includes the regional center, which is in the center of this uh, diagram here. But also on the vocational training side, there's the education. And then there's working with the Department of Rehab for that job placement and those job services that come with um, once the person is, is uh, finding work. All this requires cross-collaboration. And you can see that some of these services in each of these categories vary between, uh, may be similar, uh, between other, job, uh, between other uh, uh, system structures. So there's, inter there's overlapping and interconnection between the two. But make sure you know where your son or daughter is at. Are they being vocationally trained? Are they getting placement? 
or are they in a situation where they're um, learning pre-vocational skills or that sort of thing? In the system of services for folks with developmental disabilities, there are two strategies to get work. One is through the, develop, the, the, the day, and through day and employment programs, and one is through the supported employment programs. I'm getting gestures from everybody that I need to move toward my conclusion, so I'm not going to go into too deeply about that, but when you're having that conversation with your service coordinators, that's how you kind of want to balance your discussion. Is this a day and employment program, and what are the services that are going to be available there versus is this a supported employment program? These long descriptions here are um, things that one needs to consider at that kitchen table talk when dividing into these two systems of support. The old school way of doing things was you had to find a paid employment through the traditional employee-employer model. That is, you clock in, you clock out, you get a paycheck at the end of the day, you do work, you have a boss that tells you to do work. That is how we had to provide services in the past, and that model, through employment first, is changing. There are other ways to find work, invoice-based types of jobs. These would be in the arts, be in the service delivery, um, uh, enterprising, uh, selling a product, these sorts of things. So for those who, have, uh, who, are not, who are not too confident that the sons or daughters are going to be able to work a 20 to 40 hour work week, or who may have issues that would preclude them from being uh, successful in, a, in an employee-employer arrangement, consider the invoice base or entrepreneurial or uh, customized employment approach. Part of your kitchen table discussion is going to include financial planning, the role of S your SSI benefits, it's also and your SSA benefits. It's going to also include a discussion about your um, ability to put together a, uh, um, a Cal Able account and how to how to integrate the benefit system with um, with the with paychecks and that sort of thing. It's a it's not a straight line. The path is up, down, left, right. It spirals up and it spirals down. None of us are working at the first job we ever had out of high school. I don't think. We all change jobs. And we change jobs for a variety of reasons. It should be built into that understanding of vocational development that your son or daughter is going to want to change jobs. They're going to want to progress in their career or they may like to retire. So those are some thoughts to have as you navigate the system. I think I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. And I know we're running on a really tight clock, so um, we're trying to get through these quickly, but making sure that you guys are getting all of the, the good information that everybody's sharing. Um, next up, we have Andy. Andy is the parent of two sons with autism, a veteran of Silicon Valley, and a longtime autism advocate. He and his wife, Luby, co-founded the Specialist Guild, a nonprofit organization focused on providing technical and work readiness training to adults with autism. He is also a member of the San Francisco Tech Council and actively working on employment challenges for disabled residents. Here we are. So I like to introduce a concept of, uh, that I call social franchising uh, as a way to get our children employment. Um, this idea comes from the fact that we are moving into a gig-based economy, but if you live in a smaller community um, or perhaps in a rural environment, that might be a little difficult for you to find the services and the opportunities that may be available to someone in a larger city. So um, what I'm proposing here is that the community needs to step up sometimes and work towards putting our disabled residents to work. Uh, and why is that? It's not to make a living. It's to have a purpose. Because to have a meaningful human life, you need that as well. So what is social franchising? It's essentially uh, getting, looking around in your own community 
and looking around the world, finding examples which successfully have created employment for people. And I'm specifically talking about here on people on the spectrum since this is the autism conference, but of course this would work for anybody. So basically there are two ways we can do that. Um, we can either train people for work that is available in the community, or we can create a social enterprise. So here are some recipes on each one of those. Basically, if you, if you have been able to identify a skill that is in short supply, wherever you guys live, or you use the app from Identity4, and it, this is a skill that, that you know it has been difficult to fill in your community. You can create a program and train people who show aptitude for it. Um, either, it doesn't have to be a new program. It could be a program through a school that already exists, or maybe it's a new program for the school as well. But basically, uh, it has to be tailored to be accessible for people who are on the spectrum. Typically that means that less lectures, more hands-on. You know, a lot of people on the spectrum are kinetic learners, meaning they best acquire new skills by doing them. So we do have to customize. Um, another important point though is that it's not enough to train people to have this skill because um, most opportunities, the first question you're going to get asked is, so what have you done? What work experience do you have? So therefore, it has to be followed up with some sort of uh, practice, an internship of some kind that allows people to experience the work environment as well and gain experience in a resume. Um, but the whole goal of uh, program like this is to transition people into open market work and get them ready for it. So unless there, the opportunities do exist locally, um, it's not going to uh, succeed. Um, the bar on the bottom is actually, I run a program like this in San Francisco, and what we do is we give people 12 weeks of training and software testing, because this is Silicon Valley after all. And then we have to give them an internship which can last anywhere from six to two years, six months to two years, depending on the individual and how skilled they are and how long it takes them to get ready to do uh, a full work day. So this is just an example of what may be possible. Um, the Issue. The pros are that um, you can you can choose something that is very suited to individuals on the spectrum. Software testing is one of those spaces, but if you live in North Dakota, it's not going to be a good choice. So um, there are some cons to in this case, um, and I'm using our our company as an example. The cons are that it's rather selective group of people who can do this kind of work. And therefore, it's not the best um, for the population at large. All right. So if a better solution for perhaps a smaller community would be to create an enterprise that um, either provides a service or a product that is in demand. And of course, the service needs to be local, but the product doesn't need to be local, even actually nowadays with the internet, maybe even services don't need to be local. Um, but the whole idea here is that you combine the skill set of neurotypicals with the skill set of people on the spectrum and um, create an enterprise that, that's successful and sustainable. Um, like several speakers already mentioned, uh, typical, typically this set of employees needs ongoing support, but if this is a social enterprise, you can provide that. And you can also allow the people to work um, 
as an entry point in, in this enterprise and then grow and move beyond that and get better and better opportunities. All right, so there is some examples that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, they're not all in software, they're not all in tech. Uh, there are some, and I think it, one, of, one of the speakers mentioned that if you, if you leverage the interest of the individuals, for example, if somebody really likes making chocolate cakes, you know, a baker is not a bad idea. Um, one of my favorites is the car wash in Florida. There is actually, you know, they have two car washes, and I like it because the uh, number of skill sets range from relatively low-skilled people to, you know, the people doing the books. So the last points that I wanted to make is the whatever you do, it has to be a sustainable business that fits with the local community. And uh, you have to keep in mind that the cost, your costs and overheads will be higher than perhaps someone who's just hiring people off the street because your management is going to be more hands-on. But in return, what you get is employees with uh, a great work ethic, very low turnover, you know, loyalty, and, and hopefully community support. So thank you very much. Afterwards. Um, next, we have Anna. Anna is, oh, Anna is the Vice President uh, of Enrichment Programs and Community Relations at Friends of Children with Special Needs. She is a parent and the co-founder of Friends of Children with Special Needs that serves more than 1,000 families in the Bay Area. She is known for discovering and developing abilities, creating opportunities in employment and housing, and advocacy for children and adults with special needs. Anna. Um, you know, I want to introduce a little bit about my my passion is. Uh, of course, I have a, a son with special needs. He is now currently uh, 29 years old. And he has uh, three different part-time jobs. And he has his business card in two of the businesses. Uh, and uh, he is a documentation specialist for accounting firm and also state farm insurance. And uh, also, he is a professional musician that had performed overseas and also last month performed at uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and, you know, the, the reason that we develop all the programs that we do at Friends of Children with Special Needs is, of course, for our children. Because it's a parents support group when it first started uh, 22 years ago with 10 families, now is serving over 1,000 families in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we have common things that we want to do, and that would be bring happiness to individuals with special needs. But as parents, don't you want to do that? Yes, right? And also peace of mind for family members, because we know they're going to outlive us, and you know, who's going to know how to take care of them and make sure they thrive and be happy all their life. OK. Um, so we have different dream projects. Uh, I think some of you already heard uh, the dream housing project. So today I'm going to talk about the dream work project. Uh, we talk about employment, holding a job, uh, bringing a meaningful life to them. Actually, I always think employment is the best po day program in the world. Because if you you can uh, you don't need to depend on a day program to think of what to do with their time, and uh, and you be able to have them out there earning money and be more independent. That's the best day program. It's the employment program. Uh, but as uh, our previous speakers already spoke of, we need to do quite a bit, such as explore the interests and talent and abilities. A lot of people just look at people with developmental disabilities and they always think what they cannot do, but nobody really thinks what they can do. I'm actually one of those guilty people <laughs> because uh, I did not discover my son's talent and abilities until he was 19 years old. Uh, all I see was somebody who put their hands over the ears whenever they hear sound and whenever they hear music. But I later discovered that music to him was a completely sensory overload. 
and he was not able to handle it, even though that actually is where his talent lies. Uh, and after he overcame the, the sound sensor, sensory challenge, uh, he came out and, and learned about two months worth of music <coughs> lesson and started performing all over the community. Um, but you know, as a lot of times when we want to create a, a meaningful employment or a meaningful life for our special needs loved one, uh, we have to think outside of the box. And we, we as parents should not ever be guilty of using our own um, measuring stick to measure their abilities because they are so different from us. Um, I want to give another example. Uh, one of the musicians, completely nonverbal, has never been in a, a, a special day class other than the most severe uh, special day class. And she just won the elite international music competition at Carnegie Hall this year. And she performed there. And you, all the, the, the teachers floored completely. She's nonverbal, severe behavior, always been in a severely uh, challenged special day class, and she won the competition. And after her performance, she bowed to the back of the audience, bowed to the curtain instead of in, to the audience. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, I agree that we are looking for the rain man or the uh, what is the doctor <laughs> uh, program? But you know, there are people who to us have no abilities, but actually they have a lot of more active, uh, abilities than we do in certain areas. So um, our employment, the dream employment is to promote uh, self-esteem, have a competitive wages, protect themselves from bullying and abuse, job security. And it always, sometimes you land a job and you get fired. And that is devastating to our kids. Um, we won't, don't want that to happen. So we want to create a system that avoid all the bad things from happening to them and have uh, foster success for that, their life. So the job that will bring happiness and satisfaction. Uh, this is not you know, the San Andreas Regional uh, Center's work, but it's the work of the parents that we need to call your attention to, is to train our kids on all the different soft skills. Train them early, as early as possible. Uh, no one wants to hire anybody who have uh, no hygiene concept. Uh, so we have to make sure that we train them at home on hygiene to follow some directions, uh, verbal or written. My kid have auditory processing problem, and so, uh, you know, all his work directions are written. So he read it and he memorized it and he will be able to do it uh, every day and very well. So job training, work skills, get trained at home. And this last item, very important, is train them to love money. Uh, so my kid will work for money anytime. Uh, so, but don't have uh, any strange ideas and go up to my son Lawrence and say, I pay you this, will you do that? You know, <laughs> uh, but to be quite honest, we need an incentive system for, to w for our kids to wake up and go to work, you know, for us too. And our incentive is money. And so teach them to love money. Uh, I taught him to love money when he was six years old. So anyway, and also uh, about Andy's uh, model of uh, getting them into kind of some kind of internship, I actually train them on doing something, and I volunteer him to uh, my neighbor and say, go and, and do this for our neighbor, uh, our relatives. So you can control the internship part yourself, too. And after that, that he has done a lot of volunteering, uh, some of the, your neighbors or your relatives and friends uh, are willing to write recommendation letter, and you can build a resume and put uh, together a regular day, workday schedule for them. So it's not a complete shock 
when he is on the couch for a long time, and all of a sudden you said, I found a job for you. Guess what? You're going to work. Now, you know, if you already kind of built that kind of schedule uh, when they were young, there's no problem transitioning into work, real work. Uh, a lot of parents uh, actually were looking to the regional center or the Department of Rehab to create some work opportunities for our kids. A lot of times, the parents are the most powerful in creating jobs for their kids. We know well what they can do and what they cannot do, what kind of environment they can do well and what they can't do well. So my son, I was introducing that he has, um, he has this documentation specialist work and um, is actually, he works in an accounting firm, my accountant's firm. He works for State Farm Insurance, my insurance <laughs> agents, State Farm Insurance. So I have not known parents with nonverbal kids who work, actually the adult work at the hair salon that they, they got the first haircut and always had gone to that hair salon. So, you know, and another thing is creating entrepreneurship uh, through tailor-made jobs for the children with special needs. And if you're your own boss, if you create a business, you are the boss, nobody can fire you, nobody can abuse you or bully you, and you have your own um, hand-picked people that kind of support you and yeah. So that would be a great thing. And uh, for friends or children with special needs, we don't put our eggs in all one basket. We also have a employment, uh, day employment option that uh, David Grady introduced and also supported employment is also uh, supported in friends or children with special needs. So, and we, I want to introduce you uh, that we have a big program coming up that is supported by Golden State Warriors, ABC7, and is judged, by, this coming year is judged by the uh, executive director of developmental services, um, the, the boss of all the regional center. So uh, please, you know, take uh, some information if you think your special needs loved one, have talent, we encourage you to come and audition. We have all three regional center executive director be the preliminary judge. And the idea is we want to change everybody's mindset that nonverbal kids, uh, behavioral problem kids, actually have an area that you can never <laughs> beat them in in that, um, and also it create a motivation to wake up in the morning that you are um, reaching for the stars. Okay, so I have that. Okay, uh, this is the, the band that came out from the uh, talent winners that in, performed internationally and last month performed at Washington DC. And this <laughs> is uh, one of teenager, nonverbal, very hyper, but was able to sit uh, to make ceramic art um, and sit for five hours quietly to make ceramic art. And his artwork sells for about $50 a piece and very, sells, sells very well. Uh, we have a soap project. And Friends of Children with Special Needs just opened a coffee shop at our San Jose Center. We have two centers, one in Fremont, one in San Jose. And this coffee shop trains individuals with uh, special needs, how to make coffee, customer interface, and please stop by and, and buy a cup of coffee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I did go to that um, talent show last year, and it is phenomenal, the talents that people bring. Uh, so I, if you're in the area and you can go, I would definitely recommend attending. So last but not least, we have Gina, who earned her BA from Duke University, her MBA from USC's Marshall School of Business, and a certificate in the business of entertainment from USC School of Cinematic Arts. She founded Cardinal Blue Consulting to offer media-based strategy consulting, startup funding, TV and film financing, production and distribution services, marketing and branding strategy, and due diligence. Her experience spans major studios, media for technology companies, entertainment startups, and investment banking. Here's Sheena. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I have the uh, great position of being the last person to speak at this conference. So um, thank you for um, sticking with me to the end. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about an organization that my family um, started in North Carolina. There's a number of different replication models in different places in the United States, but we're going to specifically talk about the facility in North Carolina, um, and it's called Extraordinary Ventures. Uh, basically, we, um, my brother, uh, who is now in his late 20s, um, and some of his cohort that he went to school noticed that, um, as I'm sure everybody in here knows, at the end of school, there's a cliff, you know, entitlement ends. There's really nothing. Um, and, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to fill the day? How are you going to have a meaningful life? All the questions that I'm sure put you guys in these seats right now. Um, and so our vision was really to set up a successful businesses with the finances carried by the business, meaning that they are self-sustaining, that, you know, there was startup costs like any startup. And I'm in the Bay Area, so I don't have to explain that too much. But, you um, it's not a social program at Extraordinary Ventures. What it is is they're real businesses, um, and there's no government funding taken by Extraordinary Ventures by the businesses. They are businesses. So some unique features. Um, the uh, Extraordinary Ventures is a 501c3 umbrella where a number of real businesses, as I said before, um, fall under that umbrella. So each business is a revenue um, positive business. So there's a portfolio of businesses, meaning that we can tailor um, jobs across different kinds of um, businesses for the individuals. So the jobs are really designed around the individuals that have come uh, to be employed. There's about 65 people in total. Um, it says 50 here, but um, in that's uh, about six months old. So um, we are up to 65. So we employ the full spectrum. Um, we don't ask for anybody's um, diagnosis. We don't turn anybody away as long as you come with your support and you're able to do the job and go through um, training and everything, um, we, we welcome you. Um, as I mentioned, there's that 501c3 umbrella, but each business is run with for-profit um, motivations. So they all make money. Um, and they're uh, managed by young entrepreneurs. So we uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, are really lucky to be around a number of top universities. And so people are coming out of university uh, and they're looking for you know, um, experience starting businesses, experience running uh, businesses in an entrepreneurial setting. And so they um, manage the businesses in that way. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a replicable model. We've seen some um, successful replications in different places across the United States. So I'm going to talk to you about the uh, portfolio. So there, the first business we had is EV Laundry. Um, EV Laundry takes mostly for the fraternity's laundry. Um, and uh, they do the laundry and then you know deliver it back to the um, houses of, of people um, at the university. There's EV Gifts, which um, I hope that all you guys check out the website and buy for the holidays. The gifts include things like candles, lip balm, um, let me see, uh, jewelry. Um, I'm forgetting other things, but <laughs> uh, you can take a look on the website. EV Pets is a pet walking business, so people in the community who are at work all day, um, you know, you can have somebody come to your home, walk your pet, relieve them, give them some exercise. EV Bus Crew, we are the uh, sole um, uh, service provider to the city of Chapel Hill to clean their buses at the end of the day and turn them over for the next day. Um, Office Solutions um, is uh, everything from mailing um, services for offices to, you know, collating paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the event space rental is um, their where these businesses are located, there's a event space in the top where people can rent it for weddings, conferences, those kinds of things, and people set up and take down and support that. Um, so uh, let's see, for you guys on the left, that's my brother Vinny, um, and uh, he is delivering, it looks like, some laundry to uh, one of the fraternities, and so this is you know, hi I'm highlighting the laundry service. Um, EV Pets. Um, as you know, I'll just go through these really quick since we are talking about time, but uh, EV gifts, you can buy them online. And in our community in North Carolina, we sell at 
um, Whole Foods. We sell at West Elm. We sell at a shop called Southern Season, which is a kind of a qual high quality food um, and you know baking and, and cooking that kind of thing place. Um, and let's see, again, we have pop up shops, all that kind of thing. Office Solution, as I mentioned, went from starting out as really just somebody taking um, a envelope, putting, you know, manually putting the cards in, putting the stamp on, to we have machines now and people um, are experts at taking those machines apart when they break down and fixing them and making sure that the businesses keep going. I mentioned, you know, what happens with the bus crew, the event center. Um, and our special sauce, I would say, is we have built the businesses to fit the individuals. So um, for example, let's take the um, the gifts businesses. So we have an individual that my brother has been with school with since kindergarten, um, and he's now in his uh, late 20s. He's an artist. He loves to cook. Um, and he is, you know, just a very positive, wonderful guy. And we said, you know, you and what, you know, you really like to cook. You really like to follow a recipe. Let's make candles because candle making is really following a recipe. He heats up the wax. He combines the wax with the uh, scent. He puts it in the jar and, you know, he packages it for delivery. Um, and, you know, he's really thriving in that business. And, and he's, uh, and that was at the beginning and he's branched out and do, doing other things as well. But so the businesses are tailored around employment as opposed to um, coming up with a business idea first and then figuring out how to fit people under that, if that makes sense. So it's kind of um, opposite of a lot of different models. Um, and then adapting the environment. We have schedules everywhere. We have, you know, pictures. Um, it's a low stress environment, so there's not a lot of triggers, you know, for uh, our different individuals, um, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, more of that. Um, so, uh, you growth of jobs. I know I don't have a lot of time. So the real payoff is the people. Um, this is Paige Falk, our CEO, with some of our employees. And you know, every day coming to work um, is great. You know, whenever I'm in town and able to stop by, it's just wonderful to see um, everybody. You know, happy and um, you know, uh, coming to work and having a meaningful opportunity. You know, when you have a job, when you have meaning in your life, you really thrive and we can see that. And we also see, um, we also have some, you know, as any, as a lot of co corporations and companies have um, social programs. So, you know, we'll have a annual basketball tournament in the summertime. We have picnics, we have a uh, Christmas party, you know, those kind of things. Um, we just had an art show where um, we invited people from the community. There's about 300 people who came by to view the different art pieces and there was an auction and that kind of thing. Um, so our goals are to provide the meaningful jobs for our employees. So as I said, you know, um, disability is part of the human experience. Um, having a meaningful job makes you a great person, makes you a part of the community. And so having the uh, meaningful opportunities for our individuals is so key. We want to inspire and motivate, and we also want to uh, be a model, this replication, as I mentioned. And also, um, the reason that I'm here speaking, and I showed the film earlier, is I'm a producer on a film called Extraordinary People. Um, and it, you can go to www.extraordinarypeoplefilm.com and it um, will show you the trailer. We've been screening it across the United States. Eventually, we'll stick the whole film up there and it really goes deeper into you know, how, what this looks like and we've facilitated a number of different conversations across the United States. I think we've had about 50 screenings um, with different ASA affiliates and different groups um, and you know, what we think is we found a model that works in North Carolina, for example, that laundry business, but you know, we're in the Bay Area, there's like 10 startups that do laundry. So if you were to start that here, that wouldn't make sense. But, you know, tailoring it to the community, tailoring it to the individuals, finding where you can have uh, meaningful employment opportunities is, is, I think, the name of the game. Um, so, uh, Quickly, the lessons learned. So get started. Um, you know, I'm talking to uh, uh, you know to a community of entrepreneurs. So you know that sometimes you just got to get out there and do it, um, and uh, focus on your local markets. As I mentioned before, treat it as a business, not a social program. So while we have training, while we have um, 
different programs and those kinds of things. At the end of the day, our importance is making money. And so we have obviously like any business, a startup period where, you know, you need capital infusion, but eventually we want every business to be res revenue positive and embrace trial and error. No entrepreneur didn't um, that was successful anyways. Um, so thank you guys. I'm going to stick up here uh, and uh, thank you so much.